So before we get started, maybe there are a couple of things that I should tell you about me. One is I will apologize in advance. I cannot remember people. Okay, I uh, have a really hard time remembering names, and I also have a really hard time remembering faces, which makes for many, many embarrassing encounters when I introduce myself for the fifth time to the same person. So please do not take it personally. I will not remember you. I will be very confused when I see you. So, so don't take it personally. That's my fault, not yours. It's actually it's something called face blindness, and there's also a medical term for that, but uh, that I also cannot remember. So anyway, um, the other thing is many lecturers stop in the middle of the lectures and ask, are there any questions? And I've stopped doing that because whenever I do that, there never are any questions and everybody kind of avoids eye contact and it's very embarrassing, embarrassing for everybody involved. So I stopped doing that. So instead, please interrupt me at any time and ask me questions. And in fact, I'll interrupt myself too and ask questions to you. Okay? If you want to avoid that, be first and ask first. Okay? Anyway, so before we get started, I prepared a few handouts and I hope you have them available or ready. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, should we pass these around? Okay, great. So um, one is just a brief overview of this, what I will be talking about. There's an outline of this course, and you will notice that today we'll spend reviewing general relativity, and then we'll move on from there. I also included some references, and I gave you basically a short list of the conventions that I will use, and, but we'll go through that also as we go through the uh, course. I gave you one sheet with basic important results and that will be useful later on when we refer to earlier results so that it's just a brief summary and then finally there's a review of tensor properties and tensor manipulations really any formal course should really start with that but I think I don't want to spend the time doing that so that's why I decided to write that up for you and then uh, we can refer to that back to that when, whenever we need it okay, okay sure okay now I think, so instead of starting with a formal development of tensor properties, which we'll need for GR, what, what I'll do here is we'll start basically outlining more along the physical lines of what we expect from a general relativistic theory of gravity. But actually before we do that, I have one question for you. Who of you has taken a general relativity course? Okay, okay, great. So basically for those who have taken a general relativity course, this will be just a brief reminder. So I will not develop anything formally. I'll skip m m most details and derivations. Obviously, I cannot compress all of general relativity into 90 minutes. So this will just be a brief reminder so that we all remember, that we're all on the same page and remember who was the Riemann tensor and all of that. So basically, what I'll do is we'll just follow a basic physical description of what, what to expect. And I'll use the blackboard as some chart. In fact, let's start with Newtonian gravity. Okay, this probably brings to mind the first problem because nobody can write my handwriting, including myself. But um, if, if you have trouble, ask me. Okay, so this is Newtonian gravity. It's clear enough so far? Okay, so now so the central object really in Newtonian gravity, or basically what is Newtonian gravity? In Newtonian gravity, we describe gravity in terms of a force. And at least for the purposes of relating this to GR, what we'll say is we will consider this force as the gradient of a potential, and we'll view this potential as the central object in Newtonian gravity. So that for our purposes at least, the central object is the potential and then we say, well, for freely falling objects, the force, or the gravitational force that any object uh, experiences, the gradient of phi, for freely falling particles, the, the only force that they feel is this uh, gravitational force. So for freely falling objects, uh, ex experience an acceleration A which is minus the gradient of this potential phi. Or, if we immediately want to switch in an, into an index notation, this will be ai, the component i of this vector uh, e, uh, a, is minus the ith component of this gradient of phi. Mm -hmm. The next thing we could uh, consider is the, is the distance between two freely falling particles. So imagine we have two freely falling particles, they're falling down. We're, 
we're considering what distance or how does the distance between these two objects change. Okay? And if we computed that, we would encounter that or we would find out that that is related to the second derivative of the potential. Well, we could derive that formally, that's a few lines. I actually don't want to go through that, but it's kind of easy to see. Basically, you have one particle, then you have the second particle. Now, how do we figure out what the distance is? Well, we take basically the difference between the acceleration of the two. But if these two particles are nearby, then we can express the potential of, of one particle by a Taylor expansion about the position of the other particle that introduces the, 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 uh, a gradient, but the acceleration is already a gradient, so now we have second derivatives. Okay, so let's just note that's, that the distance between nearby freely falling objects is, involves the second derivatives of phi. Now, in the lingo of general relativity, freely falling particles, we say they follow geodesics. And now the distance between nearly falling objects, this is, related, this is what we'd call the uh, geodesic deviation. Okay. Now, how about the field equation? What equation does this potential phi satisfy? Well, we already know that's the Laplace equation. But the Laplace equation is essentially a trace of this second derivative. So what we'll note is that this, it's now the trace of the second derivatives that we need for the Newtonian field equation. Okay, so this is the Laplace operator acronym phi. It's the trace, which I can write like that. And now this is already the Einstein summation convention that we're summing over these indices of these two vectors, acronym phi, and that is 4 pi times the density rho. Okay? So again, this involves uh, the, uh, the, the trace of the second derivatives. That gives me the Laplace operator. Okay? Um, and that's basically it. Okay? So we will notice we have a central object. Okay? And if we should remember this outline in our heads, because we will use exactly the same outline to develop general relativity. We have a central object. The geodesics, or the motion of freely falling particles, is related to the first derivative of these objects. Geodesic deviation, or the distance between nearby freely falling objects, relates to the second derivatives. Then we take a trace of the second derivatives, and that's the object that is involved in the, in, in the, in the field equation. Okay. Now, I also point out that we already have a gauge freedom here, okay, because or we could really debate, uh, uh, recall that, but there's kind of a gauge freedom here. And that is that we can add to phi any constant and all the physical results will be the exactly the same because the constant will drop out as soon as, take, uh, as I take a gradient. Okay? So this, we can rescale phi as we want to by adding a constant. Okay? All right, so that's all I want to say about Newtonian gravity. Okay, but we'll just keep this outline in, in mind. How about GR? Well, in GR, we describe gravity not in terms of a force, but in terms of the curvature of space-time. And the central object in GR is the central object. Well, it's an interesting spelling of object, but okay. It's the space-time metric GAB. GAB. What does GAB do? Well, we use GAB to measure the proper distances between events in the space-time. So, for example, we write the proper distance ds squared as GAB times dxA dxB. Okay, so these are the distances. dxA measures the distance between the coordinate distance between two uh, space-time events, and then we can contract these distances with GAB to get the proper distance. Okay. Now the question is, I told you that in GR we describe gravity in terms of curvature, so how do we now measure curvature given a space-time metric? Well, there are a couple of different, way, different ways of how to do that, so how to measure curvature. Well, one way of measuring curvature would be to measure 
angles and triangles, right? You, you, you know that in flat space, if you had flat space, if we draw a triangle, then the interior angles always have to add to 180 degrees, but you know that that's not true in curved space. So for, for example, if we had a sphere, we could start at the North Pole, we could march down from the North Pole to the equator, then make a right turn, 90 degrees, march over maybe by another 90 degrees on the equator, and then go back up to the pole, and we would find it's 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees, so 270 degrees instead of 180 degrees. So we could use something like that to measure, um, measure curvature. Okay, so we could look at the sum of angles and triangles. We could also look at parallel transport of vectors. And really, actually embedded in this, I, I, I was kind of cheating because I told you we marched from the North Pole down to the equator. But of course, you, you know, we could ask, but wait, in what way? I mean, there are many ways of doing that. And you said, well, in a, in, a, in a straight line. But then you would point out, but wait, in curved space, there ain't such a thing as a straight line because everything is curved. So what exactly do we mean by that? So really, basically what we should think about is, what do we mean by parallel transporting vectors in curved space, right? So parallel transport of vectors. So that will be involved in measuring this curvature. Okay, and that leads us to this concept of parallel transport. What do we mean by parallel transport? Well, maybe we have this curved space, maybe we have some line, some in this curved space, okay? And now what we, uh, there's a vector x that is tangent to this line okay, at some point. Now we have another tensor, or perhaps just a vector, that lives on this line, maybe that's uh, it, and tensor t, okay? And now we want to move this vector along this line at each point in the direction of x, and so that means we want to move this vector t along the integral curve of x, okay? And we want to do this in a way that is as parallel as possible. Now we can picture that if we are on a sphere, so I imagine here's the sphere, okay? Maybe here's a vector, maybe that's, you know, at the North Pole, maybe it's tangent to the sphere, and now how do we par par uh, parallel transport this vector? Well, in this, we can do this in this embedding space. In the embedding space, we truly move it parallelly, but then at, after each step, we could project it down onto the sphere, and then we move again forward. That would give us this notion of parallel transport, okay? So that's how parallel transport works, at least visually. Parallel transport is intimately connected to the notion of co the covariant derivative, right? So let's review what is the covariant derivative. So well, it um, basically generalizes the notion of the partial derivative so that the result is a tensor. Okay. So it generalizes the partial derivative so that the result is a tensor. The components of this tensor are the following. Are the following. So for example, for one tensor with an index upstairs, we have the covariant derivative along A in B is the partial derivative of T B plus connection coefficients summed over C. So there are these connection coefficients gamma b a c okay now this deserves several comments to begin with the four is a harboring of things to come i decorate this gamma with a four just as a reminder that this gamma is now associated with our space-time metric g a b okay starting tomorrow we'll introduce the three plus one formalism where we'll project everything into into spaces and then we we want to deal with Christoffel or connection symbols that are associated with this in 
um, uh, uh, induced matrix on this, this, or the spatial matrix on, on a hypersurface. So basically, this is a reminder that this is a Christoffel symbol or a connection symbol associated with a space-time metric. Also, this looks like it's the covariant derivative of the B component of T. This kind of a sloppiness notation. Really, this is the component AB of the tensor that is the covariant derivative of the tensor B. Okay? All right, now in a coordinate basis, the connection coefficients are so-called Christoffel symbols. And we can write them out as the following. I mean, okay. Four gamma A B C equals one half G A D. And then we have partial C G D B plus partial B G D C minus partial B G D C. All right? Sorry, say it again? It, this four? Okay, this four is a reminder that this gamma is associated with the space time metric. Okay? So, in other words, I compute this gamma by taking d these partial derivatives of the space time metric. Okay? And again, I'm, this is, you don't see this in a textbook on GR because usually in a textbook on GR, this is the only metric that you deal with. And therefore, there's only one connection uh, symbol that is associated with that. Starting tomorrow, we'll introduce a different type of metric, which is the spatial metric. And then I, just to say, we'll use more of the spatial metric than this one. So just in order to save me some handwriting, then I want to use the gamma without the 4 for the spatial metric. So this 4 is just a, is a, a notation for not to distinguish the, the, the four-dimensional object from the three-dimensional object that we'll introduce tomorrow. Okay? Any other questions? See, I just did this to prove my point. Okay. <laughs> anyway, great. All right. Um, now, what we get now is this. Let me erase this. Okay. Now, if, what does a freely, uh, freely falling object do in GR? It parallel transports what? Sorry? So it, par it, it parallel transports its own four velocity along its own four velocity, right? So for a freely falling object, the four velocity is parallel transported along the four velocity. So for a freely, Forming object, object, or oh, free, free falling objects follow a geodesic. Okay. And what we mean by that is that the four velocity is parallel transported along the four velocity. So if I write that out, this, here's our four velocity. Okay, this is the four velocity of the object. Okay. And this, if we contract this with the covariant derivative of the four velocity, then th that will be zero. That will be a geodesic. But actually, let's write this out before we set it to zero. This will be ua times partial a ub plus uc. Now this four again, gamma bac. Okay, and that is zero for a geodesic. All right. So now we can solve this equation for the partial derivatives of u. Okay. This actually gives us a time derivative dd tau along, along the four velocity, so as observed by the observer. And then we get these terms as the sources on the right-hand side. Now, what do these terms include? Well, they're the first derivatives. Okay. Now, this should ring a bell, because what did we talk about in Newtonian gravity? In Newtonian gravity, we said that, well, the central object is the potential phi. Freely falling objects react to the derivative of the central object. That's exactly what we have here. 
the basically here the first derivatives of the center object. So we're still on track. Okay. So this in involves first derivatives. Okay. Now how about geodesic deviation? So I will not derive this, but if we did, what we would encounter is we could, we could compute, well, we, if we have two particles that are freely falling, i.e. two particles that follow geodesics, what is the time derivative, or in fact the second time derivative, of the distance between these particles? We would again derive an equation. We would compute what that is. And what should we expect to get? Did I hear second derivatives of the metric? That would be lovely, right? Because that's what we expect from Newtonian physics. In Newtonian physics, we saw the second, der second derivatives of potential. Now it should be second derivatives of the metric. And in fact, that's what we see, plus so some nonlinear terms, and in fact, complicated versions, because now we have various different ways of computing second derivatives of the metric, because we have these extra two indices, right? So, and, and all of those are buried in, in the so-called Riemann tensor, OK? So this geodesic deviation leads us to this new object, which is the Riemann tensor. And the Riemann tensor for our purposes are basically second derivatives of the metric. So let's write this, that out. Okay, so the Riemann tensor. Okay, so this leads us okay, to the Riemann tensor. The Riemann tensor measures curvature. Okay, so in fact, why does the Riemann tensor measure curvature? Another way of computing the Riemann tensor is to figure out what happens if I take, take a vector, a tensor, and I first parallel transport it in this direction, then another one, and now I'll do it the other way around. Maybe I first go in this direction and that direction. In flat space, that result will be exactly the same, but in curved space, it will not. So for, for example, if I go from the North Pole, I parallel transport this vector down to the equator, okay, I get one result. Okay, pointing down. On the other hand, if I first parallel transport this vector down in this direction along the equator, and then along here, I, it points in a different direction. Okay, so that does not commute, and that's exactly what this Riemann tensor computes. Okay, okay, and in fact, it is we take as its definition the commutator of a vector vc. Equals and here is another appearance of this four, which reminds us that I mean the four-dimensional Riemann tensor, D, C, B, A, V, D, okay? So this is how it's defined, but this is also exactly how it emerges in our computa in, in geodesic deviation, okay? It's, it's, we can compute it from, um, compute from, and this should not be a surprise, it's second derivatives, as we argued, okay? And I, uh, A, B, C, D equals partial derivatives of the Christoffel symbols A, B, D. But the Christoffel symbols already have first derivatives of the metric. So another derivatives because of second derivatives, right? Minus partial D for uh, uh, A, B, C. And you know what? I'm too lazy to write out the terms that are quadratic in Christoffel symbols. That was my excuse for giving up you notes. It's on your sheet. Probably with typos, please check and okay, let me know. But basically, the, just two more terms that are quadratic in the Christoffel symbols. Okay? But the key point for our purposes is that it has first derivatives of the Christoffel symbols, which are already first derivatives of the metric, so this gives us second derivatives of the metric. Okay? The Riemann tensor has various symmetries, which I'm also too lazy to write down. That's why I already typed them up for you. They're on your sheet. Okay. There's just various symmetries. There's just one that I will write down, including uh, if we A, B, C, D, the Riemann tensors pairwise anti-symmetric on the indices, so uh, on these first pairs of indices, so this is the minus B A C D and likewise C D is minus R A B D C. Okay? Another important thing is if we count 
the numbers of independent components in the Riemann tensor, we would find the following. In n dimensions, okay, Riemann has 1 12th n squared times n squared minus 1 independent components. All right? And again, I'm just listing facts for you. I'm not deriving any of this. Uh, this is just supposed to be a review of things. Okay. Now here's the next question. Here's the Riemann tensor. The Riemann tensor, I'm motivated by suggesting we look at this geodesic deviation. Uh, we said that it contains the second derivatives of the metric, which is our central object of this theory. Where, what we, where we want to go with this is the field equation for the metric, which we know is Einstein's equation. Okay. Now, guided by what I told you about Newtonian physics, what should we consider next? Yes? What, did we do? what happened in Newtonian physics? We saw that... Sorry? I think I heard we need to take a trace of this, right? Because that's exactly what we needed to do in Newtonian physics. In fact, that's what we should expect. And the field, equ the field equation should contain traces of these second derivatives. Well, the se second derivatives are buried in the Riemann tensor. So we should consider a trace of that. And that gives us which tensor? OK, with some goodwill from my side, I think you said Ricci, right? OK. OK, so the Ricci tensor is a trace of the Riemann tensor. Now the Riemann tensor has four indices, so there's, it seems like there's a lot of choice. Oops. There's lots of choice on how to take the trace, but there really isn't because of these symmetries. So may, the most traces that you could consider are zero identically. There's only one trace that is not identically zero. Ricci tensor. Okay, so it's a trace of Riemann. Okay. And we write it as this, R, A, B equals, we define it rather, as R, C, A, C, B. That's the only trait. I mean, I could do it on the second and, and fourth index too, but the only non-trivial trace of this, okay? By the way, what do we call the trace-free part of Riemann? If the, this is a trace, there's also a trace-free part, and that is there, what tensor? Wild tensor, exactly. Not so important for our purposes right now, so we'll ignore it, okay? Now here is a key thing that we'll, we will use this fact many times later on. There are three different ways of computing Ricci. Okay. The way that you usually learn about in a relativity course is to take a trace of this expression, and that means that we, you know, that way what you do is you compute Ricci from the first derivatives of the Christoffel symbol. So that way it would be this: R A B equals partial C for gamma C A B minus partial A for gamma C B C plus again terms that are quadratic and gamma. Okay? That's the one that you should have seen in a, in a, a relativity course. Now we could also do this differently. Right? We could say, well, but wait, the gammas are already derivatives of the metric. So we can insert those and that will give us an expression for Ricci that is immediately in terms of the second derivatives of the metric. Right? So that would give us something like that. R, A, B, equals one half G C D and now we have four terms with second derivatives and those four terms are all the possible commutations of these indices, the two indices of the partial derivatives and the two indices of the metric. So let's write them let's write them out. We have minus partial C partial D of G A B minus partial A partial D no partial B G C D and then we have a plus partial A partial D G B C plus partial B 
partial C G A D plus terms that are quadratic in gamma. Now here is a warning, okay? The warning is the following. This is different from this. Okay, basically you figure out what these nonlinear terms are. They are actually not the same. So even though they look like the same, because I'm just writing O of gamma squared, they're not. Okay? Now that was the second way of computing Ricci, and here's the third way. It turns out that of these four mixed second derivatives of the metric, we can absorb three of them in a trace of the Christoffel symbols. And then we get the following, or rather in the derivative of the trace of the Christoffel symbols. Then we get the following. So here's the third way of computing Ricci. R, A, B equals minus one half G C, D partial C partial B of G, A, B plus G, C, and now there's parentheses A, partial B of 4 gamma, gamma C plus order gamma squared, okay? And what I've done here is I've defined this new object, gamma C. This is defined as G, A, B, times our Christoffel symbol C, A, B, okay? And now when you see things like that, you should immediately think of problem 7.7 .7 in the problem book on, on general relativity, right? Do, do we all know that? Lightman, who is it? Lightman, Tarkovsky, Press, and Price? Or in alphabetical order? Who knows that book? Okay, that, for your reference, that's a great book to know about. The problem book in general relativity, in particular problem 7.7, .7 has multiple parts. This is probably part G or something like that. And what you notice is that there's an identity, okay, which tells you that this is the same as one over the determinant of G, partial A of the uh, determinant times G, a C. So we can express this in terms of these partial derivatives. Okay? This form as you will use later on. What you notice is that of these four mixed second derivatives, only one term is left over, which is the first one. And just as a little note already, you notice that this operator now takes the form of a wave operator. If we did the same thing in three dimensions, it would be a Laplace operator. But we'll get back to that. Okay? That is the Ricci tensor. We also define the Ricci scalar as the following for R equals the trace of the Ricci, uh, Ricci tensor, so just R A A. All right? Okay, now. So what have we done so far? We've basically followed exactly the same outline as Newtonian physics. We started with the space-time metric as our central object. We've noticed that freely falling objects follow geodesics, and those are related to the first derivatives of the metric. I've argued without deriving this that geodesic deviation involves the second derivatives of the metric, which are involved in the Riemann tensor. We then decide, okay, we'll take the trace of the Riemann tensor which we expect will end up in the field equation, and that traces the Ricci tensor. So now we are ready to combine that to co it, it motivate the field equation, okay? Now there's still some liberty because we can add traces of these things, and basically what we need to do is ultimately you let yourself guide by the Newtonian uh, uh, limit. You say, well, for weak fields, we already know what the field equation is, we already know what the solutions must be, and if you use that information, then we end up, we can write down the field equation for, these, for the space-time metric, and that's Einstein's equations. Okay. So we are now ready to write down Einstein's equation, okay, which is the following. GAB is 
8 pi oops, times TAV, okay? And this equation is certainly worth putting a box around. Yes? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, okay, t tell you what. I did a great thing, didn't I? I did developed all of these different tensors, okay? And then I told you now we are ready to write down the feed equation and do this, and all of a sudden there are two new tensors that I haven't even mentioned so far, okay? So let me tell you what this is now, okay? So where GAB, this capital G, which is different from lowercase g, that is the Riemann, uh, Ricci tensor GAB minus one-half times the trace, which is just R, okay? So that's the Einstein tensor. And again, you could ask, but wait, how could I anticipate that this term appears here? Because didn't I just argue so beautifully that it should be this trace of this? Well, there's this freedom of adding this term, and that's, that term appears if you consider the Newtonian limit, okay? Then you realize, aha, I need to take, take away this term, okay? Also, uh, uh, what is TAB? That is the stress energy tensor, which tells us about the density matter, the, the density the, or the energy, energy uh, momentum, and stress densities of any matter sources that may or may not be present in the in the space time. Okay. In now, what you all, there's one term that I dropped here. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The cosmological constant, okay? So I'm ignoring that, okay? Um, now you could argue, but wait, don't we know that it's non-zero? Shouldn't that be in here? That is true, you know, we should include the cosmological constant, but for the purposes of numerical relativity, usually we consider objects that are on scales that are very small compared to the cosmological, to cosmological scales. The cosmological constant really only plays a role in cosmological scales. So, Basically, I, I've, assumed the lambda, I've assumed lambda equals zero here, okay? Okay, so um, <coughs> lambda equals zero for our purposes, okay? Now, of course, you're welcome to put that back in and do everything that we'll do from here on with a cosmological constant. You can have a lot of fun doing that, okay? Okay, so uh, also in vacuum, in vacuum, the right-hand side is zero, okay, because there's no no matter source, uh, th th then the trace of all of this must be zero too, then this term does not contribute, and that means that in vacuum, actually this equation reduces to just the Ricci tensor, RAB equals zero, which does not mean, by the way, that the curvature is zero, because the curvature is measured by the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor is only the trace, so the trace free part, which is the wild tensor, that could still be non-zero, okay? okay. Now, what this is, is a, it's, we, we, basically this is the differential operator. That's how we derived it, right? It has up to second derivatives of the metric. So this is now a partial differential equation for our central object, the space-time metric, right? Just like the, the Newton's the Poisson equation is a second-order differential equation for the Newtonian potential, okay? So this is basically, this is what it's all about, right? This is, this is our jewel. Uh, that basically, we want to solve this equation. Okay. Now, this whole course is about developing numerical methods for solving this equation numerically. We'll get to that, but before we do that, we should review some of the analytical solutions. Okay. So, let's just talk a little bit about that. So, the first thing that we could consider are weak field solutions. We could ask ourselves, well, what happened? Yes, yes. Yes, because for vacuum, the right-hand side is zero, right? For vacuum, the stress energy is zero. So we just have GAB equals zero. If GAB is zero, then the trace of GAB must also be zero. But if, right? but if the trace of GAB is zero, then that means that the trace of this must also be zero, which is related to R. That means R is the trace R, the Ricci scalar is zero. And that means instead of solving GAB equals zero, I may as well just solve RAB equals zero. Did that make sense? Okay, great, thanks. Anything else? Okay, you're just doing this to prove me wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So I'm going back a little. Yeah? Uh, in the first equation on the left-hand side, 
Yeah. Yeah. Second term, GC uh, bracket A, there will be able to explain the uh, definitions that Ah, yes. Thank you. I meant to do that and then I forgot. Okay. You, you mean this, yes. this term, right? This, okay, that's on the first handout that I gave to you on, not, on, on the notations, but I meant to say that, okay? This is the, this, the symmetric part of this, okay? So basically, for, if I wrote this out, okay, if I just wrote out this term, okay, maybe I'll do it here, then that will be the same as one half times G C A partial B uh, and then gamma C plus G C B partial A for gamma C. So it's the, it's the, symmet the symmetric part. So I take half of this combination plus half of these two interchanged. Okay, thank you. Likewise, I will also use the notation with a square bracket where it's the anti-symmetric part. So it would be half of this minus half of the, the other way around. Okay, but here it's the symmetric part. All right, um, what, okay, let me erase this. Okay, for weak fields. Okay, so that's the first thing we could have look at. What happens if we have weak fields? Okay, so let's say we do the following. Let's write uh, our metric GAB as an eta AB plus a small perturbation a HAB, okay, where HAB or the magnitude of HAB is much less than 1. Okay? And now here's another word of caution. Usually, I use the notation where eta denotes the flat metric, but in any coordinate system. So that could be in Cartesian coordinates, or it could be in spherical polar coordinates, whatever you like. Okay? In this context, though, it's most convenient to just focus on Cartesian coordinates. So, okay? so here, okay, uh, I assume that eta AB is the flat metric. I ask you to trust me on that, that is that we can choose a coordinate system, okay? We have a fourfold coordinate freedom in general relativity. We can choose one time coordinate, three space coordinates if you want. And in fact, I could choose coordinates in such a way that these gamma c's vanish, that they're zero, okay? If that is true, then we immediately see that these terms are all gone, and I can compute the Ricci tensor from this first term only, okay? Now we also have these quadratic terms, but these quadratic terms only include basically the Christoffel symbols. The Christoffel symbols are derivatives of the metric, but the derivatives of the metric are now derivatives of h. Okay? So these quadratic terms are all quadratic in h, so if we li look at linear solutions, all of them are gone. And in fact, the only term that is left over in the Ricci tensor is this first term. Okay? So basically, we can choose coordinates. So that c equals zero, okay, and then to linear order in H, we have oops, R A B equals minus one half times eta C D partial C, partial D, H, A, B, okay? Now here's a question for you. Why am I entitled to write eta C, D here as opposed to G, C, D? Shouldn't it be G, C, D? Exactly, because, well, the G is just eta plus H, but the H's are contracted with these derivatives of the edges, so they're second order, so I can throw them out. Okay, so this is all I need. Okay, great. Okay. So now, if again, eta we now assume to be flat space in Cartesian coordinates, it means this is just a Minkowski metric. 
So that means we just have a minus one and then three ones along the diagonal. So we can write out these terms and this will be something like minus one half times minus partial squared partial t squared plus, and now we have just the spatial terms, but the spatial terms are just the plus operator. So this is just this operator. All of these are acting on HAB. That means now we just have, what kind of an equation is that? That's our friend, the, the, it's a wave equation, okay? So, or it can, in fact, I can write this as a d'Alembertian if you want, minus one half times the d'Alembertian acting on HAB, okay? So that's all that is left from the left-hand side, okay, from the Ricci tensor. Now we have two types of solutions, if we want. We have basically quasi-static solutions for which the time derivatives are much smaller than the space derivatives, so small that I can ignore them. Then I only have these terms left, and you already see that we get an equation that is very similar to Newton's equation. Okay? So for quasi-static, Uh, we, I, I'm sorry, that's not what I mean. Quasi-static. So what I mean is that partial t is much less than partial x, say. Okay, so in quotation marks. Okay, you, you, it's time derivatives are much smaller than space derivatives. Okay, in this case, I recover the Newtonian Laplace equation, and therefore Newtonian solutions. Okay. So these are basically solutions that are of Coulombic type. They're kind of like Coulomb solutions in, in electrodynamics, and, or sometimes we refer to them as longitudinal solutions. But what you see now is that in relativity, we have a whole new class of solutions that are absent in Newtonian theory. And those are the solutions for which we do not neglect the time derivatives. Okay? So those are dynamical solutions. And maybe I'll write them down over there. So we also have dynamical solutions, okay, so for which partial derivatives of t are of the same order as partial derivatives, of spatial partial derivatives. Okay. These give us wave solutions, okay, we, we see that because, well, they satisfy a wave equation, okay, so we have a wave equation that, that means there's no wave-like solutions. Okay, these are, sometimes we, if, if we refer to these Newtonian type solutions as a longitudinal solutions, then to these ones we refer to as a transverse solutions, but we see that that's how we get gravitation waves. That's how gravitation waves emerge from this relativistic theory of gravity. Okay. All right? Now, I'm wondering, so I think I have 90 minutes, yeah. is that right? I think I'm about halfway through, is, is that right? Would this be a good time to take just two minutes break so that we can all recover a little bit? Does that sound good? Okay, so then let me, just a couple minutes, maybe you get up and so that you can work. You mentioned that in your rotation, you have g and c to the one. Sorry? Newton's constant feels like it's long. Oh, absolutely, uh, yes, but we all know that. So, Basically, what do we do? We, we develop Einstein's equations. And I just talk very briefly about basically the weak field solution that we can get. But of course, really, we're interested in strong field solutions. And let's review a couple of strong field solutions for the case of spherical symmetry. And so let's talk about spherical symmetry. And so it's one thing in spherical symmetry, there are no waves. That means there are no transverse solutions. We only have longitudinal solutions, only these Coulombic, Coulomb type solutions. Now, I said before that in vacuum, actually, I'll talk about two different types of spherical solutions one in vacuum, the other one uh, where we have a perfect fluid that will give us the Tom and Oppenheimer Falkov solutions. Okay, so, but in vacuum, we need to solve only. R A B equals zero, okay. and basically I clearly don't have enough time to <coughs> derive this solution. 
but actually we will derive part of it later on in this course using completely different techniques. Okay? But basically, what it, I'll just report to you that the solution is solved by the, it's by the Schwarzschild solution. And the Schwarzschild solution, so that means, by a solution, I mean a space-time metric, right, which describes the geometry of the space. The space-time metric is given by the following, minus 1, minus 2m, divided by r, dt squared. And this capital R now should not be confused with the Ricci scalar. This is now the aerial radius. It's, it's a coordinate. Okay? Plus 1, minus 2m, divided by r to the minus 1 dr squared plus r squared. So this is now the angular part, r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. And often I, I will abbreviate this last angular part just as d omega squared. Okay. Now, in basically, what do these various symbols mean? Here we have m, it turns out, is the gravitational mass. How do we know that? Well, really, we would have to do like a, Dun a Gedanken experiment. We would consider what is the orbit of particles far away from the solution. We would find that we recovered the, Ke the Kepler orbits. And from that, we would deduce that, uh, conclude that the mass of this is uh, this constant m. So m is the gravitational mass. Okay. R is the aerial radius. Now, what do I mean by aerial radius? But it's the radius that I would get if I computed, for example, the proper, this, a proper circumference on a sphere of constant ra radius. Okay, so I fix R. Now I measure the proper, this proper length of, say, a circle. Okay, for example, in the equatorial plane, and then I would get two pi R. So the, from my Newtonian intuition, I would interpret that as 2 pi times the radius, and that is the, the r that I'm using. Okay? So that is the aerial <coughs> radius. Yes. Okay? Now we also know that this solution has an event horizon. That event horizon resides at r equals 2m. And now it's, of course, completely obvious that I'm doing something funky with the units here, right? Here we have units of length equals units of mass, but that is the same thing because we set g to 1, okay? Just like c sets the units of time equal to the units of length, okay? Okay. At least when I teach in the United States, oh, you have a question, yes, you should go right So here. why is it still a vacuum solution? Because the fact that we have mass capital M is causing... Uh -huh. Yes, because, uh, so, okay, so this is an excellent question, right? Because why is this, this, I told you this is a vacuum solution, and now I'm telling you it has a non-zero mass, so how can that be? Well, the point is that when we talk about mass and general relativity, we're talking about all forms of energy, okay? So it's not only the rest mass of matter, but it's all forms of energy, in particular, that includes the, gravita the gravitational energy, okay? So basically, there's... You can think of this as a gravitational potential. There's an associated with that as a gravitational uh, energy, and that contributes to the mass. So basically, this, the, the origin of this mass is, if you want, purely gravitational. It is the interaction of the gravitational field with it itself. Okay, just like in, in uh, electromagnetism, if you only if you have electric fields or magnetic fields, they also carry an energy. Okay, likewise, these gravitational fields carry an energy. And because all forms of energy contribute to the mass, we have a non-zero mass. Okay. That energy won't be part of the team union. Would be. Th that's exactly right. It's not part of team union. Okay. It's basically so team union is it measures energy densities. Okay. Uh, that come from other forms of matter. Okay. Or uh, that come from any matter, but not the gravitation field. So team union could, for example, have contributions from a fluid, which actually I'll do in a minute, okay? 
but it could also be contributions from electromagnetic fields. We could write down the stress energy tensors for the electromagnetic field. Okay, there are various different forms of energy, and they will all be, there are various different forms of matter, okay? And by matter, I mean not only fluid matter, but all forms of other interactions, okay? And they're all stuffed in the stress energy tensor. They also contribute to the, to the mass. But basically, in this case, we don't have any of that. All this, the mass, comes from the uh, gravitation fields. Okay. But a very good question. Okay. Okay. Also, again, I remind you that R A B is zero in here, but that does not mean that zero curvature. Of course, we have very strong curvature, and all the curvature is still there, but it's in the Riemann tensor. It's, it, it, this only means that the trace of the Riemann tensor is zero, but it's, it's the trace free part is non-zero. Yeah. So, uh, as far as I know, if you have a spherical star, yeah. this water solution will be the solution of the space time outside the star. Correct. And and is the mass of this star. Um, uh, correct. And you know what? The, also an excellent question. But t why don't we postpone that question? Because that's exactly what I want to talk about next. OK? And then we'll see how that m is related to the interior mass. OK? Yeah, that's also one thing. You said that this Okay, that, that part of the question, I didn't quite, you, you said you, okay, you know what, just ask your question again, maybe you understand better. You said that it's, uh, let me ask a question. Yeah? You said that in vacuum it's because of gravitational energy, so it's basically symmetric curvature that is caused by some gravitational energy. Yeah? Is that just mass which we are considering, or is this well, a physical object, or is it no, no, so the, here there's no, I mean, it depends on what you mean by a physical object, but for a black hole, there's, there's a singularity at the center, okay? So it, it, uh, at, at r equals zero, okay? So we have a, we have a space-time singularity at r equals zero, and you could speculate on how that singularity arose and what costs and whatnot, but I would like to actually not speculate on that, because we just say, well, that's, it's still a vacuum solution. There's something funky that happens in, at r equals zero, but for all positive r, it's a vacuum solution. It's it's well defined by this, okay? And the the mass that we get from the solution arises because of the gravitational fields, okay? In a minute, we'll actually talk about a spherical star, and we'll see how the mass is related to what we would consider the mass of the star, okay? The, to the matter, but let's postpone that question. We'll see that. Okay? Did you have a question too? Uh, no, okay. Okay, um, so I've just mentioned the um, singularity at r equals zero. You also notice that something funky happens at, at this event horizon, r equals 2m, because then these two components also become zero, and it's hard to figure out what does that actually mean, because this metric becomes singular at, at this point r equals zero, at the Schwarzschild radius. That actually caused Schwarzschild a lot of heartache and in trouble because he, he inf I'm not sure how many of you know all these stories, but it's this amazing story, right? I mean, Schwarzschild was fighting in World War I, and he, he, he uh, actually, I think he got a disease. He was dying of this, of this disease, and that's when he basically de derived the solution, and he died thinking that this is a purely mathematical artifact. Yes, he had derived the solution, but because of these singularities, he, he thought it had no physical meaning whatsoever, because how would you explain the singularity? It was only later that people realized that this is a, the singularity at r equals 2m is a, is a pure coordinate singularity. This is just an artifact of these particular coordinates that are ill-suited for that point, but we could choose a different set of coordinates and all is well at r equals 2m. In fact, you will derive one of the solution sets in the tutorial today. This, I'll put that in one of the tutorials, okay? And it, it's, it, so basically now we, of course, accept the solution as one of the fundamental solutions of, of, of critical importance that actually describes black holes, okay? But that's, of course, the whole term black hole was not invented until the mid-60s, okay? But, so anyway, but yeah, there's lots of interesting anecdotes around that, okay? Oh, um, Th th that's right. Uh, the, the other thing to point out is that this solution is unique. Okay, so by Birkhoff's theorem, if we if we have a spherical symmetric space-time, 
and if we have vacuum, then we know that the space-time has to have this geometry. Okay, so there's a uniqueness that is guaranteed by virtue of Birkhoff's theorem. Okay, and we'll use that in a second to find the exterior solution of, of a star. So this is what happens in vacuum. Let's talk about what happens if we don't have vacuum, if we consider a, a spherical star, say. In that case, we assume that we have a perfect fluid. That means that we now have to, if you write down a stress energy tensor, so if we, for a perfect fluid, the stress energy tensor is TAB equals rho star plus P times nu A, nu B plus P times G A B, okay? And now we have to first discuss what do all these things mean? Well, first the rho star is the total mass energy density or the density total mass energy okay and this is only the mass energy of the fluid okay and it includes both the rest energy okay so that is by the rest energy I just mean the, the, the rest mass of each particle set make up the fluid but this term also includes the internal energy. The internal energy is the energy that is stored in the fluid by us having compressed it to a certain finite density. Okay? So basically, we had to overcome some pressure to compress this, this gas, and therefore there's some energy stored in this. And this form of energy also contributes to the overall energy in our energy budget. Okay? So this is the total uh, uh, mass energy denser, density as it is observed by a co-moving observer. by co-moving how do we see that? well to compute this, the density that a co-moving observer would observe we would contract the stress and the energy tensor with the full velocity of the observer okay. and that gives us this basically compute rho star equals uh, T A B times U A U B. Okay, if we do that, basically we get these two terms. Okay, um, actually maybe yeah. Okay. Maybe I could have lowered these indices, but basically you see of, of the contraction G A B times these U A Bs, I get a minus P. I also get twice the contraction of U A with itself. What is U A U U A? So we call U A times U A equals, I think I heard it already, it's minus one, right? That's the normalization of the four velocity. We get two of these terms from here, so that gives us minus one squared, so that gives us a plus one. That means the P will cancel out and we're just left over with a rho star, okay? So this is indeed, this rho star is the total mass energy density as observed by a co-moving observer. And I'm spending a little bit of time going, doing this in detail because Tomorrow, we will encounter a different density, which is the density observed by a normal observer. Okay, so to, dis to distinguish the two, I'm decorating this row with a star, so the row star will be the density observed by a co-moving observer. Now, next week, you will also hear lectures on, uh, relative, on hydrodynamics, and basically the same issues will come up again. It's possible that the lecture will use a different notation, but for our purposes, this is what I, I'll do to distinguish those. Okay? Okay. Now, uh, okay, that was the d density. P is the pressure. And I've already told you that the U is the fluid for velocity. All right. I will make one more comment. When you talk about relativistic hydrodynamics next week, you will encounter two sets of variables. They're primitive variables and they're conserved variables. These fluid variables are so, the so-called primitive variables, and you will encounter a different set of variables that can also be used to describe fluid dynamics, but that, that have, are more useful in the context of solving the equation. Those are called the conservative variables. Okay, now anyway, we have, this is our stress energy tensor. 
And uh, we then now we can insert the stress energy tensor into Einstein's equations. We can now we of course don't have fluid uh, vacuum anymore. So on the left hand side now we really have to look for Einstein's tensor as opposed to just the Ricci tensor. Okay, but then we have a set of equations. You can solve. You can recast those differential equations, and then we get we would find that static solutions solutions. Satisfy the so called Tommy Oppenheimer Farkoff equations. Okay. And it, it, those basically are the following. So, first, we have an expression for the space time metric, which is e to minus e to the 2 phi times dt squared plus the radial line element, it turns out, is exactly the same as for the Schwarzschild solution. It's 1, or almost exactly, 1 minus 2. And now I will introduce a little m divided by r to the minus 1 dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. And this little m we can interpret as the mass that is enclosed within a certain radius r. That means we can write down a differential equation for this mass. It is 4 pi r rho squared rho star. Then we have an equation for the pressure. dp dr equals minus rho star times little m. Little m is always a function of r, so I'll drop the of r. Okay. Divided by r squared. Now this is, this is one way of writing down these equations. Basically now I'll have certain extra factors. 1 plus p divided by rho star times 1 plus 4 pi p r cubed divided by m times 1 minus 2 m divided by r to the minus 1. And finally, we need an equation for this metric coefficient phi, which is d phi dr equals minus 1 over rho star times dp dr times 1 plus p divided by rho star to the minus 1. Okay. Now, what is kind of neat about writing the equations in this way is that you notice if we consider the Newtonian limit again, in which case p is always much smaller than rho star, m is always much, sm much uh, smaller than the radius r, and this and the p is again smaller than r. So in the Newtonian limit, all these extra factors become one. We can neglect them, and we immediately recover the Newtonian equations of uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay? So this is now the relativistic generalization of these Newtonian equations, they, they, these, these equations form the relativistic equation of, hy of hydrostatic equilibrium. <coughs> okay. Of course, we cannot quite solve them yet because if you count variables, you realize there's one more variable than we have equations yet, okay. and, that, and that's what we should expect because I haven't told you anything yet about the microscopic relationship between the pressure and the density. So we need a so-called equation of state which tells us what is the pressure as a function of the density. And then together with that equation of state, we can solve these equations. And so basically, in other words, we have to supplement this with an equation of state. is a function of rho star. And then we can integrate these equations. So how do we do that? For example, we could say, well, we'll pick a certain pressure at the center. And then starting with that pressure, we can have a set of ordinary differential equations. We can solve these differential equations, basically as we move to larger radius, the pressure will decrease. Okay? 
and that gives us this dense, uh, pressure profile for each pressure we can invert the equation of state to get the density that gives us the density profile and we keep integrating this until what happens the pressure keeps decreasing that's right until the pressure reaches zero that's what we define as the surface of the star okay so at the surface of the star we uh, basically we define the surface of the star as the point at which the pressure becomes zero what do we do at that point? So now, exterior of that, we have a vacuum solution, right? I just told you there's only one such thing. There's only one vacuum solution in spherical symmetry. So that's Schwarzschild. So basically, what we do is we integrate these equations until we get to the surface of the star. And at the surface of the star, we match to Schwarzschild. And that gives us the complete space time for a static spherical symmetric star. So that is that already gives you models for relativistic stars, okay? So that, that, these are the equations that govern spherical symmetric static neutron stars, for example. So, so there's a discontinuity, discontinuity in, in the derivatives of, of quantities, okay? I mean, or, and the nature of those discontinuities also depends on the equation of states, okay? But basically, you're right. Basically, depending on exactly which functions or which derivatives of functions are discontinuous, there, there's an issue with matching that correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But anyway, this is uh, by integrating these e equations, we obtain spherical. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Yes. Absolutely. So, absolutely. There should also be, I mean, in general, this, this equation of state will depend on the temperature, on the chemical composition, and who knows what, okay? And the extra variables, so... Uh, exactly. But, but if you allow for that, then you have extra variables, okay? And then, basically, we also would need an equation that tells us about, for example, the temperature profile in the you star. another equation. Exactly, okay? But for, for these purposes, I, I say, well, the equation is cold, okay, has low temperature, okay, and then, of course, you should ask, well, you know, whenever you say cold, cold, you have to say cold with respect to what, okay? So if we're talking about degenerate stars, what we mean by cold is cold with respect to the Fermi temperature, so that the gas is indeed degenerate, okay, and in that case, it is indeed of that form, yes. okay? So, but of course, you could also argue, but wait, you know, it also depends on the chemical composition, of course, you know, so we have to, is it a carbon star or oxygen, whatever, okay? But, um, but basically, what I'm assuming here is that we have a one parameter equation of state, and then we can do this, and if, but we can obviously allow for these other things, but then we have to make additional assumptions, for example, about temperature profiles or other things, okay? Yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. Okay, so but if we integrate these equations and we, Obtain a spherical, static, uh, relativistic stellar model, okay. and we, uh, with a surface at the surface, I'll call R star, and it's defined such that the pressure at R star becomes zero for the first time, right? When we integrate this. And then we match to, to the Schwarzschild solution in the exterior. So at this R star, we do this matching. At the stellar surface R star. Okay, and uh, I, uh, in particular, what we will find if we match this and if we impose a minimum of continuity, we find that the, the mass of the spherical, the, the mass of the exterior Schwarzschild solution is then given by this little m evaluated at the, sur at the surface. So uh, m of r star equals capital M. Okay? So that basically completes the construction of a space time. It describes uh, a static, spherical symmetric, relativistic star. Okay. All right? Okay, now um, 
that basically completes everything that I wanted to say about this review of general relativity, which means that I'm a few minutes early, which is wonderful, okay? because now we have a few minutes to spare, and we can do at least <laughs> one of two things. That is, we could either go over a few things that I, I mean, this was very fast, just a very, like, an overview of this. I'm happy to go over any of that in more detail if you have questions about that. Or if that is not the case, we could, it would be wonderful if we could actually already get started on the three, three plus one decomposition. So I will make one exception from a rule right now, okay? And by rule, I mean the rule that I will never ask whether there are any questions. So I'll do that once now. If, if you would like to go over anything of this in more detail. Yeah, yes, we'll great. Could, could you speak? I, I have a half minute. Yes, okay. So basically, um, I mean, what I should say is, of course, I'm not giving you a chance to really understand this because I'm not deriving this by any means. I'm just giving you the results, okay? But basically, what, what we do is we, 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 have, we have Einstein's equations. And Einstein's equations tell us that the, the, the Einstein tensor GAB equals 8 pi times the stress energy tensor, right? Now, what I do is I want to solve those equations in spherical symmetry, okay? For a non-zero stress energy tensor, and more specifically, for the stress energy tensor of a perfect fluid. So what I do, you write down those equations, you make certain assumptions about the metric, okay? You say it's spherically, sym it's spherically symmetric. So to begin with, we already know we can choose the coordinates in which there are only two non-trivial metric components, namely this one and this one, okay? There's, we can immediately solve one of these equations. There's a first integral that you, when you derive these equations, you notice if there's a first integral. That first integral gives us immediately this term. So we see that we can immediately write the GRR term in this form if M satisfies this equation. And then you realize, oh, this equation, that looks awfully familiar. That looks almost like the Newtonian equation, okay? And we, spend, we could spend some time, but what exactly this equation means, and we, the, 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 this has to be interpreted with some care, but it is true. In the Newtonian limit, this exactly gives us the equation for the mass, the enclosed mass, right? Now, this coefficient is n not quite that, there's no immediate first integral, it's a real, you know, th there's another equation for that, namely this one down here, okay? But then you basically have, you see by making these assumptions for spherical symmetry, Einstein's equations really boil down to just a couple of equations, okay? Plus the stress energy equation. There's one thing that I completely ignored and uh, did not tell you about, and that is that the conservation of stress energy, and that is that divergence of this tensor has to be zero, okay? Now, that is a consequence of which identity? This the Bianchi, uh, Bi did I hear Bianchi? Okay, so basically this is another thing that I did not mention. Riemann, the Riemann tensor satisfies all these different symmetries. There's also this identity, which is the Bianchi identity, which tells you something about the divergence of that tensor, and basically that trans, by virtue of Einstein's equation, that transfers to the stress energy tensor, so the divergence of this tensor has to be zero. That gives us another equation, I believe it's this one, okay? And so basically by making those assumptions, writing down the equations, you can bring the equations into this form, okay? What is nice about this form is, as I said, is it, it, there's an immediate Newtonian interpretation for them. And in the weak field limit, when you can ignore all these extra terms, you in fact get exactly the equations of Newtonian Hydrostatic. Did that answer your question at all? Did yes, or no? okay, okay, great. Anything else? Well, are we ready then to um, start talking about the 3 plus 1 decomposition? Okay, that seems like an enthusiastic. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's do that. One thing that it actually is a little preamble. It basically, we'll talk about the 3 plus 1 decomposition here in the context of numerical relativity. But we should also make it very clear that not all 
applications in numerical relativity actually use a 3 plus 1 decomposition. There's some that use uh, basic characteristic decomposition or characteristic formulations. There are others that basically use a form of the Einstein's equation directly in the four-dimensional form. So this, what I'll be talking about, the 3 plus 1 decomposition, I think it's fair to say that's the most common form of solving the equations, but it's certainly not the only one. Okay? But anyway, that's what we'll pursue here. The other thing is that this is, in some sense, it's, this is a sad moment, right? Because what is so beautiful in general relativity and special relativity is that basically it's this beautiful symmetry that you learn about between space and time, right? Basically, we, and we've joined space and time into space-time, and that's a, a, a triumph, right, of intellectual uh, pursuits, right? So now we have this beautiful new entity space-time. And the first thing that we do in the 3 plus, de the three plus 1 decomposition, we, we're undoing that. In fact, we will take the space and we chop it right back up into spatial slices, okay? So if we are undoing this unification, we again introducing a foliation of spatial slices that basically then jointly make up the space-time, okay? So let's talk about that. So this is basically chapter two, the 3 plus 1 decomposition. And this will entertain us probably for two, two more days. And the first thing that we talk about is foliations of space-time. Okay, so basically imagine we have some space-time. Maybe we call this space-time M. And now we'll introduce a foliation of this space-time. That means that we'll carve this space-time up into these individual slices. So maybe here's one slice, there's the next one, there's another one. And I could, could keep doing this for the rest of the day, but I won't. Okay, but this is a basic, right? So there are many of these. And we, uh, so in other words, we, cur we carve our 4D space time huh? into a family. of spatial slices, sigma, okay? So in other words, this is now some sigma, maybe I'll label this particular slice with a sigma one, then I have another slice sigma two, a slice sigma three, and so forth. And so I'm assuming that these are spatial slices. Uh, that means that any proper distance that I measure inside one of these slices is indeed spatial. Okay. Uh, I will also assume that I can generate this foliation, at least locally, by level surfaces of some function t. Okay, so I say, well, I can always introduce some scalar function that lives in the space time. And I'll choose this scalar function in such a way that if I take a level surface of this function, i.e. some surface in which this function is constant, then that, that slice, okay, that level surface, that coincides with, these, uh, with these, uh, my spatial slices. Okay? So I assume that these are level surfaces of a function, function t. Okay? So that means that associated with this first sigma is some function value of this function t1. Then on the second slice, this function takes a different value, t2, and then we have a t3, and so forth. Okay? Now, later on, we will make this function t to our coordinate time. Okay? So we'll choose this t as our coordinate. Okay? But we'll keep that a secret for now. Okay? We don't know that yet. Okay? For now, this is just some function that may not coincide with our coordinates. I have not said anything about coordinates yet, okay? This is just some function. Now, we choose these slices also that, so that they're non-intersecting. That is the result of these being level surfaces of this function, okay? So these are non-intersecting slices. On these slices, I now introduce a normal vector. So, for example, on this slice, maybe I pick a point, and now I introduce a normal vector that intersects these slices and is normal on this, this slice. This normal vector I call an A. Okay? So I introduce a normal vector. An A. Okay. And um, 
I construct, how can I construct a normal vector? How can I do that? It's the gradient, exactly. It must be, because it's normal in this slice, it must be the gradient of t, right? Exactly. So it's, it must be the gradient of t, okay? Or it must be related to the gradient of t in any case, okay? But so to begin with, if t increases in that direction, okay, then basically we, if we want n to be pointing in the direction of increasing t, we need to introduce a minus sign so that it points in that uphill direction if you want, okay? And um, now usually we write the gradient as with an index downstairs, so I need to raise that index so that it's a GAB, so I have an upper index A there, right? Now I want to do one more thing, and I want to that is I want to introduce a function alpha okay, in such a way that I can normalize this, this normal vector, okay? But that's all I need. So this is now my, uh, uh, my normal vector. So again, the minus is there so that the normal vector points up, okay? Where I put up in quotation marks, but you know from the diagram what I mean by that, right? It, it points into, in the direction of increasing time. And so I... The t is the spatial vector stuff? Sorry? The, the metric is a 3 No, I'm sorry, this is still, uh, we don't know anything yet about spatial metric. This is the this, this space-time metric, right? It's, Basically, this uh, and this is a space-time covariant derivative. So these are all these objects that we still know from from the four metric. It's all the four metric. Okay, so this is the four metric. This is the gradient, the the gradient. Okay, okay. Now this is the normaliz This is a normalization constant. Okay, and. We will learn or that what this alpha does is that it measures the advance of proper time as I march along this vector. Okay, we'll see that in much more in much greater detail later, but be, and we'll understand that in much more detail. But I'll already tell you that we'll call this normalization constant last. Okay? And the physical interpretation of that we'll get back to. Right? So that is the last. All right, now, how do I want to normalize this vector? So we want to normalize it. Okay, we want to normalize in such a way that Na N A equals, what should this be? It should be minus one because it should be like the full velocity of an observer who always moves in the direction that is perpendicular on that, okay? But I will allow for plus one also. And the reason is simply that sometimes it's nice to just play with these concepts in the purely spatial geometry, okay? So I will allow, I will introduce an epsilon, okay? Basically for all practical <coughs> purposes, whenever you see epsilon, you can replace it with a one, but we will use this epsilon just so that when we, when we think about basically foliations of just the Euclidean three-dimensional uh, space, we can still use the same formalism, okay? So this, this is uh, plus one, for uh, 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 full velocity, okay? Or, yeah, actually, I'm not sure how to best write that, but I is that clear what I mean by that? So, if in, uh, uh, epsilon is usually plus one, okay? Except if we consider foliations of just a uh, 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 Euclidean space, then we choose this to be minus one, so that in that case, the normal vector will be spatial, okay? Or maybe we should write it this way, um, plus one, or a time like time like normal vector and it's minus one for a space like vector. Okay? Whenever we think about 
foliations of the space-time, then really it is plus one, and we can just replace epsilon with plus one, or you can just ignore it, okay? But for some exercises and examples, I also want to look at foliations of just a space. In that case, the normal vector should be space-like, and in that case, we will choose minus one for epsilon, okay? All right, now let's just compute what that is. Well, we have, uh, we insert an A, then if I have two of those terms, so this minus will cancel out. Then, uh, then I have an alpha squared. <coughs> Oops. And then I have the dot product between two of these terms that gives me a G A B times the gradient of A T times the gradient of B T. Okay. And what we see then, if we want this to be minus epsilon, then we have to choose alpha so that this is minus epsilon times G A B gradient A T gradient T to the minus, oops, minus one half, okay? That is the normalization that we get for this normal vector, okay? So again, B laid with, with a few exceptions, we will always consider epsilon to be minus one. That means n is, f, is, is time-like. n will be like the normal, like the full velocity of a normal observer. Okay, we can think of this full velocity, we can really think of that as a full velocity. Okay? Um, it's basically this normal observer tr always travels into the direction to which this function t increases most rapidly. Okay? And and this function alpha, the last, we'll see later, tells us how much proper time will advance for that normal observer, okay? How, ra how rapidly proper time will advance. Okay, I think this is actually a good place to stop. So we already got started with the three plus one decomposition. What we'll do tomorrow is we'll use all of these formulas to figure out what is the spatial metric that is now induced on these spatial slices, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you very much.